At this point in our quarter on the central dogma, we've gotten to replicate our DNA, regulate and transcribe genes off of the genome into mRNA. And today our focus will be the process of translation, which is converting those mature, spliced, polyadenylated, and capped mRNAs into amino acids joined together by their peptide bonds into proteins. And we're going to talk about translation wrapped in a deadly poison called ricin. To discuss ricin, we have to talk about castor plants and the beans that they produce, the source of ricin. The castor plant is shown on the right-hand side. Um, see the species, Isis communis. Uh, it is a plant you can see grow in the south. Routinely, people have them in their backyards. And uh, they are pretty common as uh, outdoor plants because they make nice fruit and flowers. And the fruit and the flowers produce seeds. The seeds, people can use them for jewelry. But also, you can do chemistry with them. Uh, if you do an oil extraction of the beads, you get this thing called oil, uh, castor oil. Anybody heard of castor oil? The only place I've ever heard of it is in those Looney Tunes cartoons where the, the, the kid gets the castor oil for, for punishment. Back in the day, it used to be used as a laxative or an emetic or as a punishment for little kids that were, uh, that were bad. We have other things that we use now, but different compounds from the castor plant are used industrially. Where castor beans and ricin come into play is not from the oil, but from the water-soluble portion, because in that water-soluble portion is a cytotoxin called ricin. Cytotoxic cytotoxin kills cells, and in this case, the organism in which those cells reside. And we'll speak more about ricin at the end of the uh, tra translation lecture today. Uh, but the reason why this is a, a common source for ricin industrially for research purposes or for uh, otherwise uh, purposes is because it's very rich in this uh, cytotoxin, the castor beans from the castor plant. If someone were to ingest ricin or to have it ad administered to them, it is lethal in very low quantities. I'll not go through all of the various symptoms, but it gives death with a delay of three to four uh, days. And the mechanism of action at the biochemical level involves a direct manipulation in the translation processes that you'll talk about today. One of the most famous uses of ricin, this is a historical aside, is actually an assassination attempt by the KGB about 40 years ago. There was a Bulgarian dissident in London, and a KGB agent came up with an umbrella tip with a couple hundred micrograms of ricin on the tip, and poked the guy in the leg, and then walked away. And then he was in the emergency room a few days later and dead a day or two after that. 200 micrograms of ricin. More recently, I try to update these news stories. There was an event last year, October 2018. Somebody, a man was jailed for sending President Trump and General Jim Mattis castor beans in the mail. And it's sort of linked to, to ricin and ricin poisoning. And so ricin kills by messing up in a very potent way with the core translational processes of cells. And we'll describe how that is at the end. To go from mRNAs to protein, we need to translate that genetic code in the mRNA sequence into the amino acids that are the building blocks for protein. So tying in one of the very first lectures I gave you at the beginning of uh, this class, and some of the central dogma from the last few weeks. On the right-hand side is a table that relates the triplet code, the mRNA sequences, to the amino acids that they encode. We translate three bases at a time. That's where the triplet code uh, comes, into, comes into play. And if one does the combinatorics on this, you have four bases, right? A, C, G, U, or RNA. 
And so four to the third is 64 possible, and that's what's all on the table here. Now, the table is all blue. I'm going to use to teach this in the spring. This is right around April Fool's time. Okay, so you don't need to. You don't need to know everything in the You don't need to know everything in a table. Um, however, there are some things that I want you want you to take away from this slide. First is the terminology, because we're 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 talking about the amino acid code. This term codon refers to these three base triplet species. And the genetic code and codons have multiple characteristics that I'd like you to be aware of. First is that the amino acid code is degenerate. And what does gene degenerate mean? Looking at the code on the right-hand side, you can appreciate that there are multiple codons that give rise to the same, that can give rise to the same amino acid. So I just said that backwards, but it's the same impression. That one amino acid can give rise, or can arise from multiple codons. Even though you have that degeneracy, because we're probably have 20 amino acids, which is at least common amino acids, 64 codons. So this is, the degeneracy gets you from 64 down to 20. But even though the code is degenerate, it is unambiguous. Commission. What does that mean? That means every single time one sees UUC, it is going to translate for a phenylalanine in the upper left of the table here. So there's specificity in the codon to amino acid mapping, but you can't go in reverse if all you know is the peptide sequence. You can't infer which one of the codons gave rise uh, to a specific amino acid if that amino acid is degenerate. There are upwards of six different possibilities depending upon the amino acid we're talking about. Characteristic number three. The code itself is read and translated three at a time in groups of three. So the information is translated three, and then we move over to the next three, and then it is read there. It's not a sliding window, an overlapping reading frame, where you only move over one, read three, move over one, three. It's three at a time. This non-overlapping nature of the translational machinery sets up what's called a reading frame, which speaks to the groups of three that are being read at any time. And there are three potential reading frames for any mRNA sequence. And those will give rise to different amino acids encoded just by looking at the table, whether you're shifting things one or two or three away from the reading frame. Another characteristic, even though there's 64 possibilities, there are only 61 of those possibilities encode amino acids. There are four white elements in here. The first are these three codons up at the top. They say stop because the information that's related to the translational machinery is to stop making polypeptide. That indicates the end of the translation process, and it creates the C terminus on the mature polypeptide. And there's one more codon that you do know. So this is blue on blue. You do need to know one codon which is the start codon, A-U-G. And the reason why that's important is because all translated proteins start with methionine, or a modified version of methionine. So translation starts with the start codon. The start codon encodes methionine. As with the other facets of the central dogma, we're walking through exactly the same way. I'm going to give you an overview of the process, dive into the details, talk uh, as an introductory way about prokaryotic translation, and then speak to the elaborations or differences with eukaryotic translation. First, the broad overview. What are the players in translation? We need the mRNA. We need to know where to start that mRNA and where to stop it. 
that flanks where the translation process actually occurs. We need tRNAs, transfer RNAs, to convert that mRNA information into the amino acids and thus the polypeptide. And we need the ribosome. Ribosome has two major subunits, pieces to it, that assemble around the start codon of the mRNA that will be translated. That's initiation with no details. Once initi translation initiation has occurred, there's a process of elongation, which is sampling different tRNAs from the cellular environment, evaluating how good the complementarity is between that tRNA and the mRNA template, and then performing the remarkable chemistry of peptidyl transfer, moving the one amino acid and forming a peptide bond, which is the basis of protein synthesis. Amino acid gets tethered to amino acid, peptide bonds, covalent bonds, grows the polypeptide. And then when the stop codon is encountered, all the time the ribosome is moving down the mRNA template in that three base reading frame. When it encounters the stop codon, instead of another transfer RNA fitting into this site on the ribosome, a protein fits into the site instead and terminates that peptidyl transfer that grows the polypeptide, thus releasing the final polypeptide. Once the poly final polypeptide has been released, the ribosome disassembles, and now you're back to the original mRNA for another round of translation if need be. We'll begin by talking in greater detail about transfer RNAs. When we discussed transcription, we spoke about a dedicated family of uh, polymerases, RNA polymerases, that transcribe tRNAs. The secondary structure of a representative tRNA is shown here. Multiple hairpins, so internal base pairing. Multiple things are annotated here. I'm going to draw your attention to just a handful of things that are critical. First is this loop down at the bottom of the tRNA, which is called the anticodon. I said already that translation occurs codons at a time. We have a codon table. The anticodon is what base pairs with the codon to determine whether, which is the right amino acid to be translated at that point in the mRNA code. More to say on that soon. The other important end is called the acceptor stem. This is where an amino acid is covalently conjugated to a tRNA, so-called charging up the, the charged tRNA, uh, which has the amino acid and can be a, a, is what enters into the ribosome, and it's upon which the rest of the growing polypeptide chain is conjugated to. Uncharged, charged tRNA. I should say the charging is, a, is an issue of energetics. It's not a positive or negative charge. It simply means that it has picked up an amino acid, forms an ester bond here, and this is ready for translation. The cartoon before is the secondary structure of a tRNA. This is the 3D structure, a funny configuration, lots of base pairing. And, uh, in between them, and it's this anticodon that was over here uh, before that's going in and sampling the mRNA to evaluate the extended base pairing. And so we can do a fun orientation. All the premises of base pairing, anti-parallel nature of uh, now tRNA coming in to sample mRNA, those still hold. And therefore, one can look at the orientation, phi prime end of the tRNA. And if an mRNA is here, you can infer the orientation of the mRNA based on that, because it needs to be anti-parallel. And even though they said that RNA t mRNA tRNA base pairing is, has lots of similarities with the nucleic acid hybridization binding that I've talked about before, hydrogen bonds are involved, so forth, there are an, multiple key differences 
Partly they stem from that more complicated 3D structure of the tRNA that changed the rules, so to speak, compared to if we're talking about a double helix, right, DNA. The first is that um, and it relates a bit to the degeneracy of the tRNAs. It's this principle called a wobble. I mentioned already the anticodon on the tRNA that is sampling for binding with the codon of the mRNA. Not all of the positions of that anticodon on the tRNA are perfectly poised to base pair with the mRNA. And the first position of the tRNA, which will be the third position of the codon, is flexible. And that the, the lack of strictness, if you will, on that position is what's called a wobble. It's called the wobble position. So the wobble position of a codon is typically the third, it will be the third position of a codon. Not every codon has a wobble position because it may be important, but several uh, do. And that's because, depending upon the identity of that, the anticodon, it dictates the specificity of the codon that's tolerated for it. If the anticodon's in A, in A, it will hybridize uniquely to you, but there are these other uh, bases in the, in the first position of the anticodon that can take multiple bases in the mRNA. And there's one, which I mentioned very briefly in passing in another setting called inosine. This is a special modified form of nucleic acid. There's a slide dedicated to it in a moment. It's quite flexible. It actually can accommodate three positions in the wobble, uh, in the three residues in the wobble position of the mRNA. And it relates to the base pairing that is possible in that position with the structured tRNA. A few more things about inosine. Inosine arises from a specific deamination event. That's where you heard it. It's a base, base deamination. This is also is, occurs in our cells in the absence of inadvertent DNA damage. And here's one example where you have an, a ribonucleic acid, a base that's in, in ribonucleic acid, getting deaminated to give rise to inosine. Inosine can base pair very flexibly when it's in that first position of the anticodon to three different bases. And here's one example. You can go back and double check to the, to the table. Isoleucine has this anticodon. One tRNA will recognize the following three codons. They all had AU, but they have three different um, bases in the wobble position. And all will be recognized by the same tRNA. That speaks a little bit about the, the anticodon. Now let's speak about the acceptor stem. How do tRNAs get charged, get loaded with their amino acid? This occurs via a dedicated set of enzymes called tRNA transferases or tRNA sympathases. We have 20 amino acids. We have 20 tRNA sympathases, transferases. And the way that these uh, do their magic is they require energy. There's going to be an ATP hydrolysis involved. They're structured in a uh, in a way, 3D structure, that enables them to recognize the tRNA that they're going to do the charging, loading up of. And they also can recognize the free amino acid that will be covalently conjugated to that tRNA. Bind free amino acid, bind ATP, recognize the uncharged tRNA according to its 3D structure, and then hydrolyze uh, the ATP to create that ester bond between the amino acid and the tRNA. This is a high energy bond. If we're thinking about Gibbs free energy terms, we've now moved that charged tRNA to a higher energy state. And the cell, the biochemistry, is going to cash in on those energetics when uh, doing the peptidyl transfer within the ribosome. This bond right here.
Let's revisit the mRNA now. Those are all the raw materials. We need tRNAs. We need charged tRNAs, how the recognition occurs. There is a, a certain category of nomenclature that you need to be aware of when looking at a mature mRNA species from the perspective of translation or from the perspective of the ribosome, if, if you will. As I said, translation only occurs from start to stop. There's other gene sequence outside of start and stop, and those have names. Fortunately, they're self-explanatory. We always look at, at um, nucleic acids from five prime to three prime end. Don't read into these. I've never gone around to deleting them. I want to focus on the eukaryotic uh, d d terminologies for, for these. Start, stop, upstream of start on the five prime end of the mature mRNA. After the cap, there is a sequence that's not translated. This is called the five prime untranslated region, is it, right? Or five prime UTR. Five prime UTRs generally, they, um, they're thought to regulate translational efficiency. All of the steps that you're going to hear about in a couple of moments, the, the, the kinetics, the ease with which those processes occur is dependent upon the sequence and the structural characteristics of the, the five prime UTR in complicated ways. After stop, there's more untranslated region until you hit that transcriptional stop, polyadenylation site, and so forth. That's called the three prime untranslated region, or three prime UTR. Three prime UTRs often will be the site of regulation, post-transcriptional regulation. We discussed RNA degradation, how long RNAs stay around in the, the cell. There are also post-transcriptional regulatory processes, we're going to hear about uh, next week, that recognize sequences in the three prime untranslated region and will destabilize or stabilize those mRNAs inside the cell. And so it's a reasonable association of untranslated sequence on the five prime end more towards translation and the untranslated region on the three prime end more toward post-transcriptional regulation. Yes? Yes, and so your question is, I have the, the, the blued regions of the five prime and the three prime, do, does the five prime cap or the three prime poly A tail count towards the un, those untranslated regions? Formally, no, and the reason why is usually this terminology. You can infer five prime UTRs and three prime UTRs from the original, from the DNA sequence. If you predict splice sites, if you predict transcriptional starts and, and stops, the five prime uh, cap is simply a covalent modification. It's the, it's, there's no sequence encoded in there. And the um, three prime poly A tail, even though it's a regulated process and it serves a role inside the cell, it's not stereotyped in any way. There's a range of uh, A's that are added, even on a molecule by molecule basis. Thus, it's important for the, the, the stability of that RNA, but it's not encoding any information in a sequence or a heritable manner, like the five prime UTR, the middle, and then the three prime UTR. What's the middle called? The middle is called the coding sequence, and it's called CDS because it's coding DNA sequence. It's the sequence that makes the proteins. Right? So five prime UTR, CDS, and three prime UTR. So that's the mRNA. More to say about the ribosome itself. I said briefly that the ribosome is comprised of two subunits, large and small. Ribbon diagram on the left hand side shows the large subunit to the left and the small subunit to the right. These purple magenta uh, shades, that's protein. And the silver teal colors, that's RNA. And it's 3D structure, folded, base pairing, everything else. The ribosome is mostly RNA. The protein is a couple of elaborations around the end, a couple places where Post-translational modifications can impinge upon the ribosome, but it's, a, it's an RNA machine.
We'll begin with the bacterial ribosome, give a couple of uh, numbers and terminology, and then speak to how it relates to the eukaryotic ribosome. The large and the small subunits of the ribosome can be described according to their uh, sedimentation characteristics. These RNA protein assemblies are so large that if you put them in a tube and you spin them hard enough and you spin them long enough, you can pellet them at the bottom of the tube. Hundreds of thousands of Gs, a couple hours, and get them to fall down. Depending upon how hard and how long you spin, it gives a characteristic sedimentation time. Called, and the units of this are called Svedberg units. You can imagine who invented this numbering scheme. Larger numbers are easier to sediment, meaning they're bigger. Thus, the large subunit of the bacterial ribosome is called the 50S subunit. And then the smaller subunit is called the 30S. Now, this stuff doesn't add. Okay, this is, so the, together, the 30S and the, um, the 50S give rise to the, the fully assembled ribosome, which is 70S. Yeah. Eukaryotes, because it's, again, it's this, it's this guy, right? It's just how hard you have to spin, right? It has nothing to do with the molecular weight. It's the density and the speed and things and everything. Um, eukaryotes, it's all the same, including the numbers not making sense. It's 60S. 40s, adding it together, 80s. Those things are different. Several things are the same. And that relates to these sites, which are defined re regions within the cavity of the assembled ribosome, where tRNAs, growing peptides, and other factors associate. Uh, and the ribosome moves along through those different sites. This was a later Nobel Prize gave rise, came, came from this, um, from structural studies looking in great detail on the, ribosome, the fully assembled ribosome. As you might imagine, there is a binding site that recognizes the mRNA. And then there are three additional sites that re relate directly to the process of translational elongation. There is a so-called A site, which is where the incoming active charged tRNA comes in and is sampled for whether it's good base pairing to proceed with translation. Then there is a P site, which is where the, the peptidyl site, where the growing polypeptide normally resides. And then third, there is an E site, the exit site, empty site which is where the discharged tRNA leaves the ribosome to go get charged up by tRNA synthetases outside in the cytoplasm. So mRNA binding, A, P, and E sites in the ribosome. And we'll come back to those very shortly. Let's get the process started. Translational initiation. There are a couple of distinctions. Um, between prokaryotes and eukaryotes, we're going to begin with prokaryotes. All organisms have families of proteins that get the process started. These family of proteins that start translation are called initiation factors, or IFs for short. The initiation factors, depending on prokaryotes or eukaryotes, will either bind to the ribosome, to the RNA, to both to start the process of translation. In prokaryotes, there is a consensus sequence in the um, upstream of the start, so in the 5' prime untranslated region, that informs the prokaryotic ribosome where to assemble the small and large subunits. We don't have these. It's called a shine delgarno sequence. You see, see there, consensus sequence defined bioinformatically, just like we've seen several other times. Um, but that sequence is, in many ways, like a pre-start, which is where the assembly is, uh, occurs. Small subunit comes in with its initiation factors, that initiating tRNA binds, and then after that, large subunit 
goes on, on the top and translation will start. I said all translation starts with methionine. This is true. In prokaryotes, it starts with a special form of methionine, modified form of methionine called formula methionine, or FNET. You remember FNET, PAMPs, right? one of the essential parts that is recognized uh, by the FNLP receptor and all those things. This is the reason why. Absolutely essential for prokaryotic translation to initiate. And these initiation processes, the, the assembly and the conformational changes and things, a lot of these EIFs are GTP binding and GTP hydrolyzing proteins. And it's the energetics released from that GTP hydrolysis event that give rise to conformational changes, either in those initiation factors or they're, uh, in the ribosome itself that start the process of translation. A couple things different with eukaryotes. We don't formulate our methionines, but we still use methionine to start translation. The identity of the initiation factors differs. They're called eukaryotic initiation factors, so you oftentimes see EIF. We don't have a Sharn-Delgino sequence that specifies where translation should initiate. Instead, what happens is that the, um, the eukaryotic initiation factors will recognize the five prime cap, we'll call we cap our mRNAs, use that as a starting point. And this initiation factor called EIF2 um, will recognize that cap. Assembly starts at the five prime end, and then we'll move along in the five prime UTR until the productive encounter of an AUG, a start codon. That productive encounter of the AUG then gives rise to GTP hydrolysis and assembly of the large subunit. And now we're talking 40S and 60S. That's assembly. So initiation factors, depending critically on methionine or a modified derivative, large and small subunits assembling around the mRNA. After that, translational elongation. This, we run, it, we run this cycle, it's shown on the right-hand side. We'll do one loop around the cycle, and then it's like a four loop. You do it as many times as there are codons in the CDS of that mRNA. We do a high-level version of, of this, and then we'll dive into more of the details. The cycle will start with a tRNA containing either the start meth methionine or the elongated polypeptide chain up to that point. A new tRNA charged will come in. This is in the, in the P site, the peptidyl site, where the peptide is. The new charged tRNA will come in to the A site active tRNA site, and evaluate the ability of the, complement, the complementarity between that tRNA into codon and the codon on the mRNA. If it's good, there's some GTP hydrolysis. We'll speak about these factors in a moment. Um, and then a peptidyl transfer onto the growing chain. And then there's a shift in the ribosome and the register to move what's currently in the A and the P sites to the P and the E sites of the ribosome. So they shift over here. The discharged tRNA gets kicked out of the ribosome, and then you're back to the top. So there's the binding of the tRNA. I'm describing at a really high level. The formation of the peptidyl bond, movement of the tRNA, and then the discharged TNA expelled from the ribosome. All right, now, how does this take place mechanistically? starting from the beginning. Occupied P site, empty E, empty A. tRNAs come in with their um, amino acid, ester bond, and there's a family of, what we talked about, initiation factors, IFs. We have elongation factors, too. So this one is called EFTU, not EF2, EFTU. And EFTU presents different 
tRNAs, charged tRNAs, to the ribosome. It also binds GTP. And by presenting that tRNA to the ribosome, we'll kind of work together with the ribosome to evaluate whether that anticodon codon match is good. If it's good, if it's the proper tRNA to go into the A site, there are both those GTPs hydrolyze. Oh, grab this cartoon. Here's EF. There we go. Here's EFTU presenting its tRNA to the A site. And here we have color coded the P and the E. If the match is good, EFTU then will hydrolyze GTP. That GTP hydrolysis gives rise to a conformational change in the ribosome and initiates the process of peptide bond formation or peptidyl transfer. The growing polypeptide will, it gets passed to the new amino acid that was on the new tRNA that was in the A site. In this scenario, if you had only one amino acid and then two, now the one and two are together, but they're in the A site. If there were 50 amino acids here and one new one, now you have 51 also in the A site. That's, if you will, the, the most amazing thing that the ribosome does. And the estimates is that this occurred evolutionarily one time. So the core of the ribosome, all the differences between eukaryotic and prokaryotic translation, this process and all of the, the RNA around there is absolutely conserved all the way back. So the, think, the thinking is that it happened one time. Peptide bond formation in the A site. Now the ribosome needs to move, change the register, okay? move forward in its reading frame, which involves moving that discharged TNA, uh, tRNA into its E site, and now taking uh, this polypeptide tRNA and moving it into the P site. And that occurs through another elongation factor called EFG. EFG, another GTP binding protein another GTP hydrolysis event, which moves the ribosome forward and removes the tRNA from the E site. It doesn't last very long in that E site before it has been removed. Now the ribosome has moved forward one codon, three bases, and is back to where it started. Rinse, wash, repeat, right? There's a PowerPoint cartoon of the same thing. EFTU coming in, A site, it's a good match. Move it over the, the growing polypeptide. In comes EFG. It's not a wagon wheel. All right, but moving it forward. And then after this, we discharge tRNA from the E site and then repeat. I can show it in a PowerPoint cartoon. We'll remind it in words here. But I'm not going to say this again because I have more stuff to cover. But it's here. Study guide. How do you run out of the loop? How do you get out of the, the cycle there of elongation? This is where the stop codons come in. And this is where uh, there's a different chemistry involved. Actually, it doesn't involve tRNAs. When a ribosome has elongated up to the point where it encounters a stop codon, all those stop codons upper right of the table, long polypeptide chain in the P site. But now instead of a tRNA going in and occupying where that stop codon is, there's a protein. The protein's called a release factor, shown in cartoon form, right hand side here. And what it does, <laughs> hesitate to call it a decoy. It's in there, it's fitting into the A site. The same peptidyl type of transfer that would occur if there were a tRNA also takes place, except instead of an amino terminus there that would form the next peptide bond, it transfers a water, now giving rise to the C double bond O, OH, the carboxy terminus, carboxylic acid terminus of the mature polypeptide. Now there's nothing covalently tethering that growing polypeptide to 
the TRNA, TRNA, TRNA has already been discharged. The polypeptide releases. Once the polypeptide has releases, TRNAs go away, release factor goes away. Translational complex with the two subunits falls apart, and translation is done for that round of translation. Release factor is a pretty cool protein. Here's the tertiary structure of it. Think back to what the 3D structure of the tRNA looked like. It's an example of mimicry. All of the nooks and crannies of the tRNA are occupied by release factor to indicate where translation should stop. It's right at the end. There's a couple bits and pieces of things I want to uh, say to amplify, remind what I've already said, and uh, add a, a few additional things of interest. The very first lecture was all about primary structure, secondary structure, tertiary structure. Where does that all happen? How do alpha helices and beta sheets, when do those form? They form in real time as the polypeptide is being translated. As is a, that nascent polypeptide is elongating out from the ribosome, it is folding thermodynamically, subject to all of the rules that I spoke to you about in the first lecture. Hydrophobics, okay, polar charge, all that. It is simply that the folding is occurring only with the polypeptide that's been translated up to that point. And so it folds, 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 so you can imagine it. Feeding out as a string and then instantly reaching its thermodynamic equilibrium as it's folding. If you do the energetic inventory of one cycle of translation, it takes um, four NTPs, one ATP to make the ester bond to at the acceptor stem to charge up the tRNA, and then three GTP hydrolysis events, two for EFTU and one for EFG. The thing that's kind of neat is that when you have an mRNA, and I talk about that elongation process and initiation process, it doesn't have to happen one ribosome bound to the mRNA. It goes all the way to the end, like the other ribosome just like hang out and wait. Now, if there's an open start codon and there's free ribosome and it's conducive to translation, another assembly event is going to occur. Thus, it's Ordinarily encountered in cells, our cells, bacteria, is that one mRNA will have many ribosomes translating actively on it. This electron micrograph, you can't see the mRNA, but you can see the ribosome, and you can also see the growing polypeptide chain. Five prime in, not too much polypeptide. Three prime in, whoops, over here, almost the full mature polypeptide. And that assembly of one mRNA and multiple ribosomes on it is called a polyribosome or a polyosome. And these are of interest because you can do polyosome preps in the lab. If you, you can imagine what the Svedberg units would be for one of these. You spin them out and you can isolate mRNA that's being actively translated in cells of interest. And by virtue of this polyribosome assembly, for any one copy of mRNA, the cell is maximizing translation. For the life that it's around, if you have 20, 30 different translation events coming off that one mRNA, the most protein that you can out of the lifetime of that mRNA. Remember we talked about operons in uh, transcriptional regulation for prokaryotes, and called multiple gene. Shine Delgarno sequences associated with translation of, in bacteria. Those operons are going to have multiple Shine Delgarnos along that operon sequence, such that rather here than as the polysomes, you're having multiple translation initiation events happening concurrently. So imagine this times three with the MAC operon. said this before, but we don't have um, polycystronic RNA ordinarily. But this is a recent addition. What, it, what I wanted to relate to you is that not every mammalian mRNA is translated in the cap-dependent manner like I described to you a couple of slides before. 
and also viruses. Many RNA viruses uh, would like to translate their RNA genomes in a way that steals our mammalian ribosomes from us as the host and uses them for their purpose. And the way that, that select number of the cellular genes and a lot of RNA genomes do this is through a structured RNA sequence called an internal ribosome entry site, or IRES, that creates a structural cue for the ribosome to assemble without the need of all of those initiation factors. And so it's, it, it, um, there are certain genes where you might want them to be uncoupled from the cap-dependent processes. So there could be a reason for that. Viruses definitely would like to uh, uh, use a cap-independent process because then this is a means by which they can mess around with the uh, host cell caps and then steal the ribosomes to translate their own RNA genome. Questions up to this point? Can't be that clear. All right. What I'll do now is have a bit of a transition between the mechanics of protein translation and go kind of going all the way back to the DNA sequence and explain how they relate to one another. When the DNA sequence is altered, either by variation, what makes me different from you, or may make me different from you, as well as by mutation. Let's say that there is some base damage in the somatic cell and it doesn't get repaired by the processes that we talked about before. Pick up a, a base change. What are the consequences of that base change in the DNA reflected to the protein? And there are four main categories of sub DNA substitutions to be aware of. And they're shown schematically here. Um, I should also say that this DNA sequence is shown backwards um, from the convention. So it's the template strand for base pairing purposes. So it's like the cartoons that we showed a couple of lectures ago. If a DNA substitution is missense, what missense refers to is that the amino acid encoded by that codon has been altered cartoon example here. Here's a reading frame. It's reading CTT. That will get translated as GAA. And GAA, the codon, uh, encodes glutamate. If this position here, the A, or excuse me, the T here, gets changed to an A, thymine dimer, variation in the human population, one base. Now you have a glutamine a glutamate to a valine. There are other single base substitutions that can be more dramatic. A nonsense substitution changes a codon. Instead of changing one amino acid to another amino acid, it changes that amino acid to stop. Leucine will take one substitution in the middle, just the wrong one, and it will get converted to a stop codon trans uh, release factor coming in instead of the leucine-charged tRNA. And now a protein that was supposed to be this long, only this long, if there's a nonsense substitution here. And then the uh, third category of substitution is one that relates to the wobble position. Recall that the wobble position confers some flexibility with the tRNA's capacity to base pair sample and, and, and fit into the ribosome. If there were a change, either among us or by mutation, that alters the wobble position, and recall that's the third, that's going to be the third position, five prime to three prime in the mRNA down here. If that's in a wobble position for the, uh, the right anticodon, there could be no alteration, no discernible alteration in the encoded protein, both proline, but the nucleic acid is clearly different. And these are called silent mutations. And they're called silent not because they have, um, not to imply that they have absolutely zero effect on the organism, however, that any differences that they have are not reflected in the protein sequence. The 
the, the fourth category of mutation does not involve substitutions, but instead involves adding or removing bases to the coding sequence of a gene. If by virtue of a damage event, non-homologous end joining, DNA damage tries to get those two ends to paste together, adding and removing a couple of bases. Let's say the machinery worked, it pasted it back together, but inserted one base. By inserting one base, that mutation has moved the frame, the three base fr uh, reading frame, by one. That's why reading frame is important. That's why this is called a frame shift mutation or variation. And what happens? If a gene was, were to start methionine, lysine, phenylalanine, aspartate in the proper reading frame of the gene, one G insertion between the C and the T here now completely alters the encoded amino acids downstream of there just by one insertion. Virtually all of the time, that frame shift is going to give rise to a premature stop codon in the shifted reading frame. Unless, of course, if it's a three base or six base or nine base insertion or deletion. And there's examples of that in human population, in disease. Those ones will be a different story. I'll leave you this slide, another thought exercise. I laid out four different categories of either substitutions, insertions, or deletions. Do the thought exercise about what you think would be the result of each one of those variations or mutations in terms of gain of function. I don't think we've talked about this before. Gain of function would be, would that change in sequence confer some new capability to the encoded gene, have it do something that it doesn't ordinarily do, or do something in an unregulated way, different from, way, from the way that it ordinarily operates, as opposed to loss of function, which means the things that the gene ordinarily does stops doing it, stops being able to do it as a result of that substitution, insertion, or deletion. And you can think about that for each of the four categories that I have described. How are we doing? Can't tell if it's tired, sleepy, bored, somewhere in between mixture. Let's go back to ricin. Now we have everything we need. It's a protein. It's a toxin, but it's a protein-based toxin comprised of two subunits that are different, therefore a heterodimer. shown in uh, yellow and blue on this slide. The two subunits are called ricin A and ricin B. Ricin A, which is in yellow, is an enzyme. And we'll speak about the enzyme catalyzed modification that occurs uh, when ricin enters the, the cells. That's the cytotoxin, the portion of, uh, of ricin. But as an enzyme, as a macromolecule, right, it's going to have polar residues, hydrophobic. There's not a dedicated channel for ricin A. It's not going to be able to enter cells efficiently. The other subunit, ricin B, is what enables the entry into the cells. And how does it do it? It's in another family of proteins, which I hope you heard about. Uh, when, we, when you did the complement pathway. It's called a lectin. Lectins are proteins that bind sugars. In the case of that complement, the lectin-mediated complement pathway, it's binding unique sugars on uh, bacterial surfaces. Here, we'll speak to why the lectin, the sugar binding uh, characteristics of rice and B are important for entry uh, into cells. Um, but it's what enables the toxin to interact with cellular membranes. It has to work together 
with rice and A to be able to, to exit. Uh, one other thing is not only can this lectin bind one sugar, it can bind a whole host of sugars. And some of you have heard about uh, it falls into the category of agglutinins. And a, what agglutinin means is that they um, bring together multiple species. So it's the multivalency of the lectin, its ability to bind multiple sugars. If you put this to, in with red blood cells or something like this, it'll have agglutinating activity, which means it'll glom up all the red blood cells and form a big um, aggregate. And this heterodimer is held together outside the cell by a disulfide bond. Sounds familiar to some first quarter material, right? Botulinum toxin, remember? Membrane bind, binding, toxin, oxidizing environment. Here it is again. The one part we're going to expand a little bit on, a little bit, it's really hard to talk about this slide because it, it's um, scooping in many ways the protein trafficking lecture that I will give you in the fourth quarter. So we'll say this on a high level simply so you can keep track of some of the topology, but I'm not going to dive too much into the details because it doesn't directly relate to translation. Um, for ricin to get into the cell and into the cytoplasm, where it's going to do its damage, it follows in many ways the reverse process that our proteins do to get out of the cell. So the way that we secrete proteins, cytokines, growth factors, extracellular matrix proteins, is that we translate and then we traffic out to the plasma membrane, an exocytose. Ricin does it opposite. Step number one is that that ricin B, the lectin, will dock onto the plasma membrane surface through sugar-modified proteins or sugar-modified lipids that are abundant on our plasma membrane surfaces. Glycoproteins, glyco-sugar, glycolipids. And in the trafficking lecture, we'll talk about why there are so many sugar modifications on extracellular proteins. But sugar, sugar everywhere, sugar coat on the outside of the cells. Lectin comes in and binds to those sugars. That binding on the, the plasma membrane will set a trigger for internalization. It's going to go inside, pinch off a vesicle. And that process of internalization is called endocytosis. And once you pinch that in, it, it forms what's called an endosome. So it's a little vesicle. The inside of that vesicle is topologically identical to the outside of the cell. So it's still reducing, excuse me, still an oxidizing environment. It's just now inside the cell rather than outside of it. And these things, all, all of these arrows should be drawn bidirectionally. Some goes in, some comes out. So some will go and get returned, a process called recycling. Others will end up going into lysosomes. I think we had at least one pre-lecture on lysosomes, acid hydrolases, place where different constituents get broken down and bro broken up. So some of it will get degraded, doesn't do anything. But a small fraction will go back further into the membrane trafficking of secretory proteins, and the next step before those trafficking vesicles is the Golgi apparatus. An organelle I think we've mentioned not at all yet in this class, but we will. And, and that trans-Golgi is the very end of it. More recycling, but the upshot here is that if some of that heterodimer has made it all the way back to the Golgi apparatus, that environment is the conducive to conformational changes of the ricin heterodimer and escape of the ricin toxin from the inside of the Golgi apparatus into the cytoplasm. Step seven is the bad part. All of the interiors of these vesicles are all oxidizing, oxidizing, oxidizing. But once it's been released from the Golgi and into the cytoplasm, we'll call it reducing environment. The disulfide bond is broken apart from ricin A and ricin B, and now there's free ricin A enzyme in the cytoplasm. Oh, I scooped myself. All right, that's the answer. What I didn't tell you though is what's the, what's the enzyme catalyzed event that ricin A performs. And this is a pure depurination event. 
We spoke about depurination events with DNA damage. Depurination does not uniquely occur on deoxyribonucleic acids. It also can occur on, ri on ribonucleic acids. Specifically, the depurination event that occurs here is in ribosomal RNA at a specific site that is essential for the binding of those elongation factors, the EFs or their eukaryotic orthologs. If you can't bind the elongation factors, the ribosome cannot move forward on the mRNA template, and no more translation happens. First thing to say is that that depurination event, there's no reversibility in this. There's nothing that goes, can put back the purine on the modification that's catalyzed by the ricin cytotoxin. Therefore, that ribosome is dead forever. And we'll remind that enzymes are not consumed by the chemical modification, whatever chemical process that they catalyze. Thus, that rice and A molecule that just killed one ribosome is released after the depurination event and can go on and seek out other ribosomes in the cell. And depurination can occur 50,000 cycles, estimated, for one rice and A molecule. And our cells have about 10 million ribosomes in it. Do the math. A couple of hundred molecules of rice and A will be enough to completely disable the translational machinery in cells. And so this is the reason why you don't need to poke somebody with very much ricin. Milk can get in for it to be lethal. Yeah, so we talk about weaponized ricin, right? And why else so might, might you use this? Um, there are some, you have to be careful when you order it, uh, uses in the lab. So the, the depurination event that's catalyzed by ricin A can be very effective for test tube experiments where you want to stop translation at very potently at a very specified time. So I've seen it used there. Um, also, it speaks to protein RNA interactions because you have, an in, you have a protein recognizing a big RNA macromolecule. How does the catalysis occur? If you're not interested in the basic science aspects, it also can, has been used therapeutically. Envision a ricin, instead of envision ricin A, instead of being conjugated to ricin B, it's conjugated to an antibody whose antigen is some cell surface epitope on a cancer cell. Now, one could envision administering very small amounts of that ricin, but targeted specifically to the cells that have high levels of that antigen on their surface. And so this notion of antibody-conjugated immunotoxins, you can do it with things like this, and there's other examples, FDA-approved examples I can think of. I'm done. If you think translation is interesting, we have uh, Aeon uh, Bayer in microbiology, right? Immunology and cancer biology. Nobody stopped me. I hesitate to reward that by letting you go early. Um, what, what questions can I ask? Answer. You guys are like totally toast today. Yeah. Yes? Yes, and so I went over that part quickly related to the shifting. That now we've seen the whole thing. Let's go back to the thing I said in the beginning, maybe a little bit too fast. A, P, and E sites are defined as three base sites. So all of the motion and the, the uh, translocation of the ribosome is moving three at a time. And that's what sets the, the reading frame. I should say that that was not obvious. Francis Crick and the early molecular biology pioneers, it was a thought experiment to try to figure out how you get RNA and turn it into protein. And all of these things were on the table, <laughs> moving over one at a time, moving over two at a time. And there were debates about the information carrying capacity of the RNA and how you could use how it could be used, what made sense to encode the proteins based on what they what they knew. So a long-winded answer to three at a time, three at a time. So three, jump over three, jump over three. There was one other there was another question over here. Um, 
Ah, I mean, okay, to the recording. There are proteins on the ribosome. You need release factor to translate. How do you get this whole process started? Um, to remind, let's just talk in the steady state. We haven't gone through cell division and mitoses and things, but you're, you're starting, even at the very earliest part of life, right, egg, sperm, they have ribosomes in them. They have release factor in them. They have genes in there that are encoding. You're not like booting up just from the RNA. But I think you, you do speak to the conundrum of how does this start? History, origins of life, and all of these other types of types of things, right? Which I don't think we've, we've spoken about, but, but the thinking, go back because we've done, we've done the core part of central dogma. Like what's the most remarkable part? Hmm? What does the coolest stuff? It's the RNA. RNA can do enzyme catalysis, the ribosome. RNA can code information. RNA can form higher order structures, can be used for recognition, all these things. So the, th the thinking, the most likely thought, is that it started from an RNA world. And then they had that remarkable event with the, the ribosome to be able to translate proteins as more versatile species. But it's not heritable. Okay, so if the RNA make a ribosome that starts making nascent proteins, and then at some point, life discovered that DNA was much more stable and, and heritable. It's less susceptible to um, thermal damage and things than, than RNA. And that became uh, the, the, the better backup hard drive for the cell. And then off you, off you go. Mm -hmm. Excellent question. So not all lectins, again, not being at the, the, the lectin that's involved in the complement pathway, it is a mannose-specific lectin. The term lectin refers broadly to any protein that can bind any sugar. And we have a whole host of other eukaryotic, mammalian-specific sugar modifications that are recognized by other lectins that we encode or that microbes, toxins exploit. And so the ricin B is a category one that binds the glicnax and you know, all the different ones you'll, you'll see uh, in quarter four. All right, I feel better after a couple of questions. Now I'll let you go. See you next week. <laughs>